So good evening. My name is Maggie Hutchison, and I'm a member of the John Carroll University class of 2014. I'm also a co-president of the New York City Alumni Chapter. Thank you all for joining us tonight. We're so glad that you've decided to spend a portion of your day connecting with each other and learning from two dedicated JCU alumni. We hope that tonight's program will provide you with a sense of the power of the JCU experience and that you learn a bit about how to further your career in today's changing environment. It is now my honor to introduce Jim Coyne, class of 1982, and Matt Rodak, class of 2007, our featured guests. Jim Coyne is a partner at Stonely Capital, LLC. Since 1994, Mr. Coyne has led or played a key role in the acquisition, financing, and oversight of companies that have invested in excess of $3 billion in real estate, finance, and transportation related assets. He has partnered in real estate companies that have owned over 3,000 apartments, 1 million square feet of commercial space, and 1,000 single family building lots. He has also invested in and served on the boards of companies that have operated ultra premium hotels, owned ski resorts, and hospitals. He is formerly the president of PLM International and executive vice president of Equus Financial Group. Equus and PLM were leasing companies that invested over $2 billion in commercial aircraft, shipping vessels, rail cars, trailers, and other equipment. With PLM, he served as the primary executive officer for five different SEC reporting companies. Mr. Coyne has a BSBA with a finance concentration from John Carroll, where he is currently a member of its board of directors and on its finance and investment committees, a master of accountancy from Case Western Reserve University, and he began his career as a certified public accountant with Ernst & Whitney, a predecessor to Ernst & Young. Matt Rodak is the founder and CEO of Fund That Flip. He started the company in 2014, which provides fast and reliable capital to real estate investors. Matt has since led the company to number 42 on Inc. Magazine's fastest growing private companies, number 17 on the Financial Times' fastest growing companies, has been recognized as an industry thought leader for the M Report, listed as a founder to watch in the Startup Weekly, and was recently named as a top 50 financial technology CEO by the Financial Technology Report. Fund That Flip is headquartered in NYC with an office in Cleveland, Ohio. Matt and his wife, Caitlin, class of 2009, live in New York City. So finally, before we jump into some of the prepared questions for Jim and Matt, a quick note about tonight's program. At the conclusion of the moderated portion of the program, you will have the opportunity to ask Jim and Matt questions. Please use the Q&A or chat feature to ask questions. We will do our best to get to as many as possible. All right. So to start it off, Matt and Jim, neither of you are originally from the greater New York City area. Can you tell us a little bit about your journey to New York City and how you have built a successful career? You want to go first? Sure, sure, happy to. Welcome, everyone. Thank you, uh, thank you for taking the time to, to join us tonight. I'm actually dialed in from from Cleveland. So, as Maggie mentioned, we've got a we've got an office in Cleveland. So, uh, back in back in Cleveland today, but um, most of, most of my time is spent in New York City. So, um, yeah, my my journey to New York, I think, was somewhat interesting, and I'll I'll go into the way back way back machine, I guess. I, I, um, I think it'll provide a little bit of context, but I'm originally from uh, the Canton, Ohio area. So grew up in a small town called Louisville, played high school sports and also had a, a small landscaping company when I was, when I was growing up and ended up doing a lot of, uh, a lot of, a lot of work for um, real estate investors. So guys that were buying houses and fixing them up and reselling them or, or uh, renting them out. Um, and at a pretty young age, you got this, this neat opportunity to see, uh, people taking, you know, otherwise very distressed properties and renovating them and turning them into, into something nice and lifting up the neighborhoods as, you know, as, as well as making some money. So um, towards the back end of my high school experience, I said, that's what I want to do when I grow up. So uh, ended up going to John Carroll, um, played four years of, of college football there and studied finance um, with really the goal to get into some type of real estate development on the, on the back end of, of graduating. Um, fortunately or unfortunately, I, I graduated in 2007, uh, right when the, the real estate market was um, starting to unwind itself quite a bit. So um, weren't a ton of opportunities in, in real estate development at that time. So I ended up taking a job with a, a large commercial property insurance company, 
um, called FM Global, um, cut my teeth kind of rising through the ranks initially as a, what they called a production underwriter. So one part business development, one part, you know, risk analysis. Um, worked for that company for the better part of seven years. It was a great experience. My, uh, one of my last gigs that I had there was um, actually running sales and marketing for a, a division of the business, middle market division. So they had grown from a $50 million company to about an $850 million company over eight years. And um, through that period, didn't, didn't really institutionalize their sales and marketing function. So I, I was given the opportunity to do that and get to travel over the world and really cool experience. And I, I like to say the biggest thing that I learned through that experience was that um, I didn't want to be an insurance executive the rest of my life. No offense to any insurance executives out there. Uh, it's a great career, but uh, just, just kind of wasn't for me. So um, wanted to get back into my initial passion, which was real estate investing. So started doing some, uh, some real estate investing and um, the move from Cleveland, I first moved from Cleveland out to Providence, Rhode Island, which is where this company was headquartered. So that was my, my move to the East Coast. Um, Providence is about a two and a half, three hour drive from, from New York. So I did spend a decent amount of time in New York, had some buddies down here and got to know the city a little bit, but um, started to get into real estate investing and, and through my experiences, um, a house flipper, for lack of a better term, I learned of the lending side of the business. So there's this whole industry of what's called private money or hard money um, that lends short-term capital out to people that are investing in these properties. It's the, it's the part of the business they don't show you on HGTV, but uh, you know, behind, the, behind the scenes, the guys that are financing a lot of those flips. So I um, thought that was a really cool business and saw some opportunities to, to bring some lessons that I'd learned in my, um, my corporate career in terms of um, you know, technology and, and process improvements and digital distribution um, to this industry. So um, had this idea to create this lender that would uh, uh, create a better experience for people that needed to borrow money. And on the other side, um, I saw this opportunity to invest in this asset class of, you know, real estate investing. And a lot of people either don't have the time or the expertise to actually flip a home, um, but they may have some capital that they'd like to invest in a home. So wanted to create a, a product on the other side of our business where if you had some, some spare change laying around and, and thought real estate was something that was interesting to you and um, maybe wanted to diversify out of the stock market, um, could do so in a, in a scalable fashion. So the idea was uh, on one side, build a, a business that's you know, technology enabled to make borrowing money easier, but also create a way for passive investors to invest in the assets that we originate. Um, which was fun that flip. So I had the idea while I was still in, uh, still in Rhode Island, figured that uh, New York City would be a, a better place to try to start, start a, a FinTech business, if you will. Um, and it also so happened that my now wife was living in Washington, DC. Um, so New York was a convenient meeting point between Providence and New York and a place that you know, worked for both of our careers. So uh, we moved to New York in 2014 and um, started the company. So in a lot of ways, uh, what drew me to New York was this, uh, this business idea that I had and um, the ecosystem that, that was present in New York, I thought would, um, would set me up for at least opportunity to be successful. Thanks, Matt. Okay. Uh, my journey is a little bit longer because I'm about, I'm old enough to be Matt's dad, but um, <laughs> So I, I uh, as, as Maggie said, I started off um, at ENY. Actually, I interned um, with their national office when I was in Cleveland. And uh, uh, when I finished school, I went to the Chicago office. And uh, I, I had always liked real estate uh, in, in, in general. But um, uh, I was working um, on a cu couple of bankruptcies a uh, long time ago um, and was spending most of my time down in, in Louisiana. And uh, there was a, a partner who I worked with. It was an oil and gas bankruptcy, but he, he uh, invested a lot of his excess time and capital in, in real estate. He owned a bunch of uh, buildings in, in New Orleans. And I, and I had asked him, I said, well, geez, you know, how'd you, how'd you get started in that? And, and so he gave me one of these really cheesy books on how to buy real estate with no money down. And I read it, <laughs> it took about, it took about two hours. Um, and uh, so when I got back to Chicago, I, I started, uh, I bought a condominium for rent for no kidding, I think $1,500 down, um, owned it for 30 years, always had positive cash flow. I then bought a couple unit building and so on and so forth. And within two years I, I had left and gone to work for a, a real estate uh, syndicate, a real estate 
in investment firm. That was in that was in 19, uh, 1985. And at the time they had about maybe 500 million of, of assets under management. And by about 1990, when it, you know, blew up in a, in a wonderful way, um, they had about 15 billion in assets. So it was, it was just this huge growth uh, trajectory. And um, right before, you know, and so they, they kind of blew up in this, you know, when all we lost the whole savings and loan, the, the thrift business and around 1990, but, but right before they, uh, they did uh, uh, become insolvent, they had bought, uh, and, and I was always a finance guy. So, so my job was to raise equity capital uh, for them. And most of that, uh, they were in the form of securities. Um, but they, they had bought an equipment leasing company out of Boston. And, um, so they had asked me to move to Boston and, and, and kind of head up their, their equity desk there, which I did. Um, and, uh, uh, so that, 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 that's what got me to the East coast. Um, and, uh, after a couple of years, um, in, in Boston, um, uh, a, a guy who was also with the company and myself had the opportunity to, to buy that company out of the, uh, the estate of this liquidating uh, real estate uh, company. And sorry, that's my dog that's locked outside. If you hear her barking in the background. Um, so, um, uh, having kind of come at the business from the, the securities side or the, the, the finance side, um, uh, running, running a leasing company and, 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 and a real estate company, they're, they're both the rental business. It's kind of the same business if, if you think about it in its crud crudest uh, form. Um, uh, but after, after doing that for a couple of years, uh, my partner and I uh, bought a pretty large public real estate company that we took private, uh, bought some other companies along the way and kind of maybe about 22 years ago for no other reason than um, uh, uh, we wanted to get closer to New York. We, we both moved to a uh, suburb of New York. Um, which is where I live now in, in, in Connecticut. So, so that's, um, that's kind of my journey. Great. Thank you, Jim. Can you guys tell us about the importance of building a professional network uh, and how that impacted your career? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, for, for, for me, uh, uh, you know, when you're in the, when you're a deal junkie or you're in the deal business, you know, you've got to have a network, right? Because if you, if you have to go out every time and, and look for opportunity, it's, it's going to take you forever because in this business, you, you kiss a lot of frogs, you know, before you find one that, that, that you like. So, um, you know, having a network, um, you know, having a network of people that know what your niche is, um, uh, is really important. It's, it's, um, it, it, it's, it's probably important no matter what you do. Um, but for me, it's been particularly helpful because uh, whenever we go out and try and find a deal, we can never find it. And uh, when we're not looking, somebody calls you and says, hey, you know, I think I have an opportunity that kind of fits with what you do. Great. Thank you. Yeah, I think for me, I mean, this is something that I think I learned from my dad a little bit as a kind of a career salesman that, you know, it's not what you know, it's who you know. And I kind of took those words to heart at a young age. And even coming out of John Carroll, I got plugged into, you know, all that Cleveland had to offer. There's a group here called the Cleveland Professional 2030 Club, which um, if anybody's dialing in from Cleveland, I would highly encourage you to check out. And, and for me, coming out of school, it was a great experience to, to develop some leadership skills, being part of that group, but also um, you know, find some, some mentors, uh, early on to, to, to learn how to, um, you know, navigate the, the, the first career that I was trying to figure out coming out of school. Um, you know, I think, you know, having learned some skills then from that, when I moved to New York and it's one of the reasons I wanted to move to New York was because what better place in the world in terms of like building a network than in New York city in terms of opportunity and, and just amount of, you know, action that's going on here. So, um, you know, I, I never really started a real company before. So I got plugged into a couple of groups here, one called the, the Founder Institute, which was, you know, kind of a 
don't quit your day job before you start a business um, group and, and actually work through what it means to start a business and put some structure around how to start a business. So um, that was, that was tremendously helpful for me while I still had a day job and trying to figure out, should I quit this really good job for this, you know, this dream of uh, what's now fun that flip. Um, and then, you know, I'm still involved with that group and, and try to give back by mentoring now people that are in a, a similar position that, that I'm in, but um, also creates a, a really cool um, place for me to, to see early stage startup deals that I may want to invest in or talent um, of people that right are, are passionate about doing something and building something um, and may not be able to get their idea off the, off the ground, but are looking for something else. Uh, we also got involved with the technology accelerator in New York, um, you know, moving to New York and wanting to start a company with almost zero network. Um, you know, so we got, we got involved with this, this group called Entrepreneurs Roundtable Accelerator, which actually started as a, um, before it was an accelerator, it was just called Entrepreneurs Roundtable, where they'd bring um, investors and venture capitalists and startup people together once a month and talk about, um, you know, trends in the technology space. Um, but that network's been incredibly helpful. Um, we've raised uh, about $13 million of venture capital money. And most of those relationships have come from uh, people in that network. But, um, you know, more importantly is, you know, they start, you know, through, through the founders that they bring in, you know, over 20 companies a year. So um, they've really been helpful in terms of making sure we don't make mistakes that we don't need to make because, you know, it's likely somebody, someone else is, is likely done what you're trying to do in some form or fashion previously. So, um, super important and in, in, in some ways in the, in the circles that our business uh, operate in through these two groups, um, I can almost get a meeting with anybody that I want in New York City, which is, which is, which is pretty cool. That's really important. Absolutely. So Matt, you mentioned a little bit about mentorship, but can you guys speak to where you see your Jesuit ideals in life now and what you kind of learned at John Carroll? Um, yeah, I'll go first on that. So when I was at John Carroll, you know, I, I, I wouldn't say that I was the model, you know, Jesuit student. <laughs> but uh, as everybody on this call knows, you know, you can't, you, you, you can't really, really avoid it, right? It's, it's always in the background. And, um, you know, I, I would say for me, um, probably, you know, where, where it really started to uh, come out is when I when I had my first child and you know all of a sudden um, you're not the most important person to you anymore right and um, you it 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 uh, kind of changes the way you 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 look at the world and 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 what you want to do and um, you know now that my my oldest is about 28 I've got four kids um, uh, you know, you you can look back on your business accomplishments and say, "Wow, this was great." But what you what you really do is you you look back um, at your children and 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 you say, "Did I create um, the right environment for them to grow up in?" And what kind of uh, people are they? And I I really believe that uh, had I not gone to uh, Jesuit school that um, I wouldn't feel as strongly about that as I do. Yeah, I mean, I think for me, it's kind of, it's kind of in two parts, right? I think John Carroll does a really good job of teaching you how to think. Um, so not too dissimilar to Jim, I, I wasn't the, the best student. I, I got okay marks and didn't really like going to class, but particularly didn't like going to all the liberal arts you know, classes, which I was like, I'm a business major. Why am I taking philosophy and religion and right? You know, all these other, you know, these courses. Um, now on the weekends, I listen to philosophy podcasts like for fun, right? Because it's the way of, of, of thinking. So like, I think the thing that I didn't truly appreciate almost until I was a couple of years out of school was um, how the, the complete package, I think of the Jesuit education is, is, is really teaching you how to think. And it gave me, I think, a really big leg up um, when I got into corporate America um, because I was I developed a, a skill of solving these very difficult problems that either other people couldn't figure out or want to do simply because I had this idea of, well, let's just break it down, right? And think think about what it actually is and, and solve it from you know first principles back up. So 
Um, and I think it was that. And then I think the, you know, the motto, right. Men and women for others, I think, as I've now built a company, um, we try to instill that in our, in our leadership of, you know, um, you know, how, how you, you know, as a leader, I'm here to serve the people that, that work for the company and, and, you know, create environments for them to be successful. Um, you know, and, and try to help them, you know, the co-leaders of the business create environments for their people to be successful. Right. So, um, you know, and, and this idea of servant leadership, I think is, is very important in business of, you know, if you can, uh, one, don't ask an employee to do something you yourself wouldn't be willing to do, but also be willing to roll up your sleeves and help and move obstacles and train and teach, um, I think has been super important to our company's success as we, as we've grown very quickly. Um, you know, by creating that empowerment through, through trust, but ultimately through, you know, making sure your people, our people understand that, you know, you're going to make mistakes and someone's got your back and we're going to figure it out. We like to say, we hire a lot of actually John Carroll people. And we like to say, there's no mistake you can't, there's no, there's no mistake you can make that I can't fix if we know about it. Right. So got to tell us about when you make a mistake, but like, there's nothing you can do that's going to break anything. And it creates this, I think, real, real sense of confidence with, with people on taking chances and, and, um, you know, pushing things forward in a, in a, in a way that maybe um, you wouldn't get if you're constantly worried about, you know, am I going to get in trouble for this? Um, yeah, that's great advice. Thank you. So you both have shared about how you've built your careers, but how has that all pivoted with our world changing minute by minute right now? Is there a pandemic going on or something? Is, is there is, is something going on? Yeah, <laughs> pandemic, uh, lost power and internet access, everything. Yeah, Murphy's <laughs> Law. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think look, it's been I think a tough year for a lot of businesses, and and we're not a we're not immune to that. You know, we had the we had the best quarter of our company's history in Q1, and then you know we almost did zero revenue in Q2. So it's been a it's been a bumpy couple of months. Um, you know, but I, I like to say, right, you can, you can kind of sit back and sulk and, you know, suck your thumb, or you can say, man, this, this market's probably going to create a lot of new opportunities if you're paying attention and staying optimistic and, you know, actually leveraging the assets that either you as a person or, you know, we as a company have, have put together. So, um, you know, we're, we're heavily, heavily relying on capital markets. You know, we work with hedge funds and publicly traded REITs and insurance companies to buy the loans that we originate in addition to having our, you know, our retail crowd base. And all those guys just went away, they totally went away in, Mar in March. Like we're not buying loans, <laughs> right? If they're not buying loans, we don't have a, uh, a place to put them. Um, you know, so we, we just doubled down on some of the other assets and strengths that, that we as a company had. And, um, you know, we've now set new records in terms of, you know, capital that we're raising online, largely from people that we've never met before, right? So, um, you know, it still kind of blows my mind. We raised about $9 million in the last two weeks on the internet into real estate deals, right? So like, you know, that was, a, that was almost a year. That was our first year of how much money we raised, um, you know, back in 2015. So, um, you know, the market's giving us this new opportunity of the stock market's doing weird things. People got stimulus money, you know, it, it, you know, so now they're saying, oh, I understand real estate debt, understand what's happening here. And they're looking for different places to park their money. So we're trying to take advantage of that. Um, there's also different cycles of the market, right? So kind of going into this, we liked being a lender, right? We liked kind of being in a more protected position uh, against the assets that, you know, were originating. For better or worse, I think there's going to be some opportunities to be equity owners in real estate assets as we start to come back out of, um, you know, as things kind of start to, to, to shake out over the next couple of months, right? So we're now starting to think, well, how do we put investment products together for our investors so they can participate in, in equity, the equity part of real estate? Um, and also even looking at new markets, right? Like, you know, uh, Jim and I were talking about this earlier this week. Um, you know, I didn't like do, I didn't like the idea of doing loans up in, you know, parts of Connecticut and parts of Long Island um, six months ago. And I only want to do loans in Brooklyn. Um, I don't want to do any loans in Brooklyn right now because um, I don't know what people, if people want to live in Brooklyn anymore, given, you know, COVID, but you know, the real estate market up in Connecticut is um, on fire. Right. So I think the important thing is, is, you know, the market's going to do what it's going to do. And you, there's only so much you can kind of control. Um, 
control what we can control. And I think take what the market is going to give you um, and make, make the most of it is, is how we're thinking of it. Yeah, John, John Cunningham, I saw you shaking your head uh, when he said the Connecticut market, you know, where for the last 10 years, neither John nor I could probably give our homes away. And, and, and now there's, there are people coming out of the woodwork to, to, um, uh, to move up here and, and I have an apartment in, in the city and I, and now I couldn't give that one away. So, okay. you know, it just, you know, you can't, you can't win, but um, yeah. So um, uh, uh, changing minute by minute, I, you know, whether it's minute by minute, because right now we happen to be in this pandemic. I mean, the, the, the thing is um, uh, there's always going to be change regardless of what line of business you're in. I mean, change is inevitable. You know, I mean, technology has an effect on on, on things, um, and yeah, we're we're um, in 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 our business. We're seeing um, w we have some hospitality assets that are are struggling. You know, yeah, yeah, how do you how do you run one with five percent occupancy? And then um, uh, we have a uh, we have a, a development project in in uh, Western Canada, and July was one of the best months in terms of lot sales that we've had in, in years. So, um, you know, you, you have to be, you have to be a little bit uh, nimble. And, you know, the nice thing about the real estate business is it's a massive business, right? I mean, it's, it's, it's huge. Uh, the, I think the, the commercial, the, the U S commercial real estate assets are, 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 I think valued at somewhere around 16 or $17 trillion. Right. And, and, and residential real estate, um, I think, is valued at around thirty trillion dollars. It is a it is a massive um, a massive industry. Um, but y y you know, it, it, each sub market is different. Each property type is different, and it it gives you you know when you've got that much scale, it gives you an opportunity to pivot. And sometimes you just have to pivot. And um, you know, I've 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 pivoted many times <laughs> in my career. You know, and just when you think something is is over, you know, uh, something else pops up in a completely different you know part of the country or or, or part of the financial spectrum. So, I mean, um, yeah, I just think being nimble uh, is is critical to any. Uh, career uh, that you may embark upon. Yeah, I'll just, I'll just add, add to that. I mean, I think that what we talk about a lot here is like, enjoy the process, right? Like we're in, we're in whatever business we're going to be in and, and, you know, business is going to change, but what's important is enjoying the process of it, right? Of growing a company, of discovering new customer needs, of creating new products for our investors to invest in, of building technology that will make the, you know, the experience better for our customers. So like we focus less on like externalities, right. Of like the market's going to do whatever it does. And like, you can drive yourself crazy trying to predict what the market's going to do. What we want to focus on is what is our process for solving problems, for communicating, for growing the company, um, building technology. And let's like, we can control all of that. Right. So like, let's enjoy the process of what we're building um, the people that we're building it with and whatever the market gives us to Jim's point, it's a, you know, the, the residential real estate space that we play in 30 trillion. I think, I think the statistic was like, that's like as big as the two largest GDPs, like nat like country GDPs. So it's like the U S and Chinese GDP, like put together, like in one asset class, right? It's so like huge market. There's always going to be opportunity no matter what it's, it's doing. Um, as long as you're, you know, truly dialed in on, you know, what are our core competencies and how can we leverage those core competencies into, um, you know, the opportunities that exist today. And, 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 you know, it's funny, uh, cause Matt, uh, so historically I was, I, I've been an owner of, of real estate. I've, so I've, I've been the equity and, and, um, uh, but now that I'm, I'm, I'm 60, <laughs> I would rather be debt. You know, I would rather, I would rather, um, you know, one, my, my time horizon is not as long. And, um, 
you, you know, having somebody else be in the first loss position is pretty appealing to, <laughs> to somebody, you know, when you're, when you're on, on the back nine in it. And, and now, now Matt is getting into the equity side of the business, which, which I think is, um, is good. And that's, and that's, uh, that's, that's right for him. So, you know, again, um, change, you know, change, it comes with age. It comes with, um, you know, where you are in your life and, and things like that. So, you know, I guess it, 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 uh, it's just part of that natural evolution. Great. So you both have kind of reminisced a little about looking back on your career and how you started, but is there any advice that you would give your younger self as you started out? Yeah, I'll take this one first. I mean, I think you're, the, Matt, uh, you're still young. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Depends how you define younger self, I guess. But, uh, um, yeah, I mean, I, I think, I think the biggest thing that I've learned really is that like nobody actually knows anything. Right. So like you got this as a young person, this idea that like, Oh man, like, you know, I, I need more experience before I can go and start a company or I need more money before I can go and you know do this or, um, you know, the reality is, is like everyone's kind of figuring it out as they go, um, you know, and, 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 you know, everybody kind of puts their pants on one leg at a time, right? So like, um, I, I think if, if, you know, I could have started this company, you know, right out of school, maybe I wouldn't have figured it out because I did have some good experience through corporate America, but like, I wish I, I almost wish I would have taken some more risk earlier on doing things more entrepreneurial or buying property sooner or, or figuring it out. But I had in my mind this idea of like, I need to go get some experience. Um, and, and I think the reality is, is experience is important. Don't get me wrong. And, and, you know, but I think the most important thing is actually getting that experience, like paying the tuition, as we say, like when you make a mistake, right. Uh, like that, that sucked and like that cost us some money, but like we paid the tuition, but we learned a lot. Um, doing that in small increments as soon as possible, I think is, is um, the only thing maybe that I wish I would have started doing earlier is taking some, uh, some more, call it entrepreneurial risks, um, you know, which maybe would have accelerated my path to where I'm at today. But um, that's the main, that's the main one, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, so I won't, I was going to say pretty much the same thing that, you know, when, when, you, when you're younger, absolutely, that's the time to take risk. Um, uh, and, you know, with risk, you, you have successes and you have failures and it's okay. And, you know, when I had, when I had failures and I was younger, you know, I probably thought the world was going to end, but the world doesn't end and, and you learn from them. And um, uh, you actually do become better. You, you, you learn far more from your from your failures than you do from your successes, you know, cause su success, you, you know, am I really just a smart guy or did I get lucky? Was I in the right place at the right time? You don't really know, but you know, when, when, when there's a problem, you, you know where it originated. Um, but I think the other thing I would, I would say looking back is, um, you know, don't, don't, uh, don't take yourself too seriously. Um, I think you, uh, you know, there's, there's, there's a lot to life and, and what you do for a living is only, uh, only a part of that and you've got to enjoy it. Yeah. Just, just to add to that, I think is, is, you know, I think the, the big reason that a lot of young people, you know, fear failing is they, they, myself was included. was like this embarrassment factor of like, Oh, what are my friends going to think? What is my family going to think? And let me tell you, like no one's paying attention. Um, they're all, they're all so wrapped up in their own, you know, their own, you know, fears and problems and everything else that like, if anything, they're going to be, you know, super supportive and proud that you actually went out and tried something. So I think like, that's a big fear, even for me today, right. Is this constant, like, oh man, people are going to think I'm a loser if this doesn't work out, but it's kind of like no one actually pays attention and people have very short memories. Right. So even if they are like, oh, like you know, look what Matt did. And, you know, I told him that wasn't going to work in a week. They already forgot because their life is way more important than thinking about you. Right. So kind of Jim's point of, you know, don't take yourself so seriously. Like no one's paying attention. Right. And if you mess up, like no one will probably even know that you did. <laughs> and if they do, they won't remember very long. <clears throat> Thank you both. 
Um, and we just have one final question left. I want to remind everyone that you can submit any questions through the chat feature. Um, but Matt and Jim, both of you have remained connected in John Carroll in a variety of ways. So maybe you can explain a little bit about why you decided to remain involved with John Carroll. Um, I'll, I'll go first on this. So, you know, actually I, I did not uh, remain connected to John Carroll from graduation till, till now. And as a matter of fact, you know, I, I think I probably went 20 years without visiting campus or, or being involved. And, and at some point, uh, you know, I, I, I was reintroduced uh, to John Carroll and the, you know, kind of the, the, the flood of memories and the, you know, the goodness of the place. I mean, the, you know, these things that you didn't think about for a long time kind of come to the surface. And, um, uh, you, you know, that was, that was really important. And then, you know, for no other reason than, than I'm, I'm older and I have a little bit more time, my, my kids are grown. Um, I think it's a, uh, it's a great place to give back. And, and I, you know, would like to be able to say that, you know, maybe I have my small little finger in helping younger people be able to uh, get out of it what I got out of it. And um, I take pleasure in that. Yeah, I mean, I think for me, John Carroll's given me a lot, right? So I, I, as I mentioned, I met my wife there. I've got, you know, eight of my best friends from, you know, from John Carroll. We go on a, a trip every year, right, that I, I met there. I have a, a lot of, like Jim, a lot of good good memories there. Um, you know, and I, and I think John Carroll still has a lot to give, right? And I'm, I'm a big believer of you, 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 you know, you get back out of something what you give to it. So, um, you know, we've, we've hired a lot of folks out of the Bowler School of Business and other you know, other, other schools within John Carroll as, you know, fantastic employees as we've grown our company. We've got a big, big office here in Cleveland. Um, you know, so I think, you know, being, playing around the hoop, if you will, and, and, you know, being networked, as Jim said, you know, helps us find really good talent that help, helps grow our business. Um, but I also think, right, the more that we can all collectively help John Carroll, the, the, more, um, the more valuable our degree becomes collectively, right? So, having sat in rooms with some, some of the, you know, quote unquote, smartest people from all the Ivy League schools on the East Coast. I, I think John Carroll, um, you know, and the, the education that we get and the talent that it produces is as good, if not better than some of those, just in the terms of how we learn to, you know, we think. And I think, um, you know, the more, you know, good talent that the school can produce, um, you know, lifts up that, lifts up that brand and, and it starts to, to, you know, be a self-fulfilling um, kind of positive loop back around, you know, good people come out of it, have good sex, successful careers, hire more John Carroll people, right? And, and it builds that brand, which is good for, for all of us in the long term. So, um, you know, some of it is truly altruistic and, and wanting to give back from everything that you know, John Carroll's given to me, but at the end of the day, we're all doing things for, you know, reasons that are going to be good for us. And I think, you know, there's nothing wrong with that either. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. All right, so we've got some questions coming in. Um, first, how did your training in ethics and values, so maybe part of your philosophy, your religion courses, and part of the liberal arts core, um, how did that impact your career and how do you think today's graduate can leverage these as they enter the market? Um, I don't, I, I don't know how you leverage them, but, um, uh, you know, ethics and values, you know, I, I, I've said many times, no matter what you do for a living, uh, someone's going to invite you to do something that's, that's not right. Uh, some sometime in your career, and um, and if you're not sure whether it's right or wrong, it's probably wrong. And um, you know the most damaging thing you could do uh, is you know, like we said, it's okay to take risk and it's okay to fail. It's not okay to do things that aren't okay, and that's the biggest way to ruin your career. 
uh, at a young age. Yeah, I agree. I think it's, it's, you know, the difference between right and wrong is, is usually pretty clear. And, and I think two reasons, one, like I like to sleep at night and I sleep very well every night. Cause like, I don't have anything looming over me around like, man, I hope I don't, you know, get caught in that. Um, I think the other thing that, that I learned, um, you know, early on is like, it's, it's very rarely the crime that gets you in trouble or the problem as much as it is the cover up. So I think what happens a lot for, you know, a lot of people that find themselves in a bad situation is they make an honest mistake and they don't want to own up to it. So they try to cover it up, right? And then to cover it up, they got to do something else. And then, right, it snowballs until all of a sudden you're doing something that truly is like, that's really bad. Right. And you look at kind of what the, the initial root problem was. It started that, which was like, not bad at all. We just needed to address it. So like, you know, again, it kind of goes back to what we talk about early with our people is you're going to make mistakes. We can fix mistakes. Let's talk about the mistakes. Um, I don't think a lot of people actually intend to do wrong things in business, but they are embarrassed or they make small mistakes that compound themselves. Um, it's just not, that's just not worth it to me. Right. When particularly, you know, oftentimes, you know, the problem could have been solved with a, with an honest, maybe painful conversation, but an honest pain, painful conversation and, and, you know, could have righted it before it kind of spun out of control. So that, that would be, I guess the, you know, right and wrong, I think typically is pretty black and white. There's that gray area and then we've sent in the gray area, get out of it as quickly as you can by, you know, writing it. I think you could both guest lecture in the business ethics course and just summarize it for everyone right there. <laughs> um, Matt, we have a question specifically for you, but Jim, if you um, can speak to this as well. So can you talk a little bit about what you've seen in JCU graduates that you've hired um, versus those that you've interviewed and what makes them stand out? Yeah, I mean, we, we go to a lot of career fairs, and I think John Carroll does a really good job of preparing their students for the working world. I know there's a new program that I wish was there when I went through, but um, I believe, I think it's, I don't know if it's just Bowler across, you know, the schools of, uh, I don't think he, the kids even get credit for it, but it, they start at freshman year, and I think it goes all four years where it's, you know, how to write a resume, how to shake a hand, how to do research on the company that you're interested in working for. So it's basic blocking and tackling stuff, but um the students are, are, are very prepared and present themselves well um, during kind of the initial point of contact and then throughout the interviewing process. So um, whatever the school's doing from a career center perspective, as well as the cl class, I think it's, we don't, we, I've yet to, yet to see another school that does as nice of a job preparing the students for the whole getting hired process, which at the end of the day is the whole reason we spend the money we, we spend on higher education. Um, but I think it also gets back to, you know, what we, uh, what I mentioned earlier of, you know, the, the students know how to think, right? And our business is such that, and most businesses are such that it's very nuanced. There isn't a playbook for a lot of the, you know, how to do your job. It requires, you know, thinking and problem solving. Um, so that, you know, that, that foundation of, you know, why, right? Why, why are we doing it this way? Um, I think is, is a very just good skill set that we can, I can teach you how to underwrite a loan or how to service a loan or how to sell a loan. I, I can't teach you how to, you know, ask the right questions of the customer to actually figure out what their motivations are um, without some, some thinking. So um, I guess those would, would kind of be the two, the two big things that we really, we really had some success with. Yeah, I'd say the same thing. I, I, I mean, I haven't hired any any John uh, Carroll people, but I have a a, um, a huge uh, 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 affinity for liberal arts uh, kids. Um, all four of my kids went to liberal liberal arts schools, and um, you know, uh, you're just so much more well. You 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 you're going to learn the technical part of whatever it is you're going to go into. Someone will train you. Um, you know, it, it, someone's not going to train you in, in, in critical thinking and, and logic and some of those sorts of things. So, um, uh, yeah, that's just, it's, it's just a great back. It's a great background for anything you're going to do. Great. Thank you. 
Um, let's see, I think we have just a couple more questions, uh, potentially from a, someone interested in investing in real estate, but do you think real estate values will plummet due to um, the pandemic situation um, based on unemployment and you know, eviction laws now um, coming out? Do you think that there will be long-term effects in six months, one year? You know, what do you kind of see the real estate market looking like in the future? Yeah, I'll give my I'll give my take. I mean, I think the, sh the short answer is like it depends. And there's a saying: there's no such thing as a, a national real estate market. I think um, you know a lot of people remember 2008, where real estate was the you know the the crux of the of the recession. Um, and we saw, you know, almost across the board, um, you know, a reduction in values. And, and I think this time is going to be very different. I think you are going to see certain markets where there's a, a bit of pain, um, particularly, you know, we mentioned New York City earlier, you know, these higher, um, you know, higher density urban areas where, you know, there's a lot of taxes and a lot of other things that just are unfavorable and we're, we're not great for, um, you know, the environment, you know, going in. Um, but this, this market is very different. We've got, um, we've got a shortage of housing, you know, across the country in, in most parts. So it's very different than in, in 2008 where we had an oversupply of housing. Um, and you've got um, quite a bit of, of homeowners equity still in, in a good number of properties. So do I think there will be opportunities? Absolutely, I think there'll be opportunities. I think there'll be, um, you know, some people that are perhaps overextended. I think there'll be some investors that, you know, took out too much leverage and perhaps are overextended. I think there'll be certain asset classes that, that are more challenged than others. Jim, Jim mentioned hotel businesses and, um, you know, a certain type of assets that are, that are going to be, be painful. But I, I don't, I, what I don't expect is a, a repeat of 2008, if that's the, the, the crux of the question. Yeah, I, I, I agree 100%. I mean, there, 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 there are going to be markets that, that do well, and there are going to be markets that don't do well. And real, real estate has, has been a cyclical <laughs> asset class forever, right? Um, but, you, you know, and it, it's like whenever there's, there's, there's great change, um, you know, things, things generally kind of come back or, or, or revert to, to some kind of a uh, mean, but, but, uh, it, w when things come back, they, they don't always come back the same way, right? They come back differently. I, I, I would say, you know, on the residential side, I think uh, the whole, uh, you know, evolution of Zoom and people finding out that they can maybe work remotely is going to, you know, really help some of these high quality of life places like Colorado, which has kind of been on a tear anyways, um, you know, maybe Arizona or, or, or uh, you know, again, like Matt said, uh, Nevada, you know, no, no low state income taxes or no state income taxes. So, um, yeah, it's going to help certain places and, and there are other places that are going to get hurt. But if, if things get hurt too badly, that's when you want to buy. right? So. Don't catch the falling knife. Wait till it hits the right, ground. Yeah. But, um, yeah. Yeah, maybe that answers this last question. So if real estate values have and will continue to come down in New York City, do you think it would be a good area to invest in? Um, or maybe they'll stay down due to future worries. I think maybe that's a hard one to answer at this point. But what, what, I'll, what I'll say is I, 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 I will never bet against New York City long term. I think that city is incredibly resilient and serves a very important function for our country. Um, and there will always be people that that want to live there for, you know, all of the, the things that New York has to offer. I do think there's a, there's going to be a tough, you know, 12 to 24 months ahead um, while the market, you know, sorts itself out. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think, again, I, I, I would, not that I want to give anybody any type of investment advice, but I, you know, be patient. Um, it'll be, it'll be very clear. I think when that market starts to, to find its bottom and I think it's not, it's not yet. Yeah, I, I, I agree. It just depends how far, how far it goes. You know, if all of a sudden you can buy something for 300 bucks a foot that you were going to pay 1100 bucks a foot for, well then, you know, you buy it. And, um, uh, it's, 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 it's an international city, right? I mean, it's, it's, um, uh, it's, it is the financial center of 
the world. Um, you know, so I don't think that's going away. I think I think long term, you know, there 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 are other trends at work, right? But you know, for the next twenty or thirty years, I think if it comes down far enough in the next couple of years, grab it. All right, and then I think we have time for one last question. Um, so could you speak on the future of real estate in the industry and perhaps uh, your thought process on data sciences in the real estate industry and how you can maybe incorporate that? Matt, you're probably better at this than I am, so. Yeah, I mean, I think there's, there's, a, there's a ton of opportunity in in real estate always, right? I think the, uh, you know, one of the sayings that a, a good VC says is, you know, um, good team, bad market, market wins. Uh, big, big market, you know, bad team, market wins, good team, good market. Like that's where the magic happens, right? And like the common denominator there is like big market, like always is going to like carry, right? So to our, our point earlier, it's a multi-trillion dollar industry. So like there's a lot of stuff to do. It's also an industry that tends to move very slowly in terms of like technology adoption because there's so many entrenched players that are trying to collect their proverbial rents by not having things change. So um, I do think there is going to be, I do think that is starting to shift. Um, and I think actually COVID could be a very interesting accelerant to that. Um, you know, there were, there were counties in, frankly, a lot of people in the real estate industry that like could not, you know, conceptually understand how a closing would happen virtually before COVID. And like all of a sudden we're doing, you know, remote notary closings on Zoom, right? That like, from my perspective as a lender, like I like a lot better because now I've got a recorded, right? Uh, thing for my file of a person notarizing and stamping and signing my loan docs which is a heck of a lot better than that happening at some lawyer's office that like nobody's got eyeballs on, um, right? And like, now that people have done that, like why do I ever wanna go to a, a, an in-person closing again, right? Like I can do it on my computer without ever leaving the house. Um, and that's just a very, a very small thing. So yeah, I mean, I, mean, I think there's gonna be a lot, of, um, a lot of change that happens on the other side of this. Even a lot of our guys that um, you know, are, are buying properties, they used to have to go out and, you know, go into the property. They're not going to the properties now because no one wants to let them in their house. So like they figured out how to get inspections done on the phone. Right. Uh, and they're just using very, you know, basic technology today with FaceTime and zoom, but there's businesses in there, I think to be, to be had um, specifically to data. Yeah. I mean, um, you're already starting to see it with, you know, the, what they call the eye buyers. So the, um, you know, Zillow's in it a little bit. Um, you know, some of these companies that, that buy houses based on very large data sets and, and um, AI and different things like that, that, that try to predict, um, you know, one, who's potentially a motivated seller and two, where there's potentially value based on appreciation and some other things. So um, very excited about what's called prop tech or, or retech. Um, I think there's a lot of stuff to do in this industry. Um, and it'll look very different, different I think, in, in five to 10 years, if nothing else, just how we transact. What, what was the first part of the question again? Um, oh, let me go back. Uh, the future of the real estate industry oh. and then kind of your thought process on data sciences in the real estate industry. So, yeah, let me, let me take the first part. Um, I'm not a very technologically savvy guy. So I'm really bad at the, at the second part, but you know, the future, look, real estate, you know, um, people need places to live. Right. And, and they're going to need places to work and they're going to need places to recreate. And, you know, for the most part, let's, let's put second homes aside. You can, you can generally tell when a market gets overbuilt because if you add more units than you have population growth, you know, generally, you know, you've got a you've got a trend to a mean there, right? Um, so, look, the future of real estate is 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 great unless people stop having babies and and there's no growth. And if that if that happens, we all have bigger problems. Well, thank you both so much for sharing. I think I definitely learned a lot. I came in knowing nothing about real estate, and now I feel like uh, maybe I know slightly more. 
So thank you, Matt and Jim, again. We truly appreciate your willingness to be with us this evening and for sharing your experiences and expertise with us all. Your alma mater in the New York City Alumni Chapter is better because of your involvement. I would also like to thank all of you who decided to join us as well. We hope you enjoyed this program and that you join us again soon for another New York City Alumni Chapter program. Finally, Great. I also, oh yes. Great job, Maggie. Oh, thanks, Don. <laughs> I also want to make sure that you're aware of some other programs being offered by John Carroll. This fall, the Office of Alumni Relations is launching the fall semester of the Alumni Continuing Education Series. Eric should be posting some links in the chat right now if you are looking for anything. Topics include the women's suffrage movement and the ratification of the 19th Amendment, the future of space exploration, the 2020 election, the brewing industry, the beauty of life and resurrection in art, and many more. You can learn more about these programs at jcu.edu slash alumni. Finally, if you have any questions or suggestions about programs that you'd like to see hosted by the New York City Alumni Chapter, I'm always open to ideas. Please email us at newyorkcity at jcu.edu. Thank you so much again, and I hope you all have a wonderful rest of your evening. Thank you, Maggie. Great job. Thanks, Maggie. Nice job. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, y'all.